their solution um, using either technology or uh, the math that they're learning in class. Um, and that's been great to kind of bring the math to life um, and again, look at different approaches and different ways of solving problems. And of course, bring in uh, student skills um, and passions into the work that they're doing in class. Great, thank you. And James? Good morning, my name is James Inhouse and I'm the Director of Fine Arts JK through 12 at Flint Hill. Um, it's hard for me to pin down a single event um, when the month of April is so uh, <laughs> dynamic for our, um, for our department. So I'm considering the month of April to be a single event yeah. that I'm really excited about uh, because it contains a pyramid concert where all of our music ensembles uh, collaborate on different pieces. We hold that concert at George Mason University every year. Um, it involves our upper school musical. It involves our visual art show in which every flat surface in the upper school is covered with artwork and photography. Um, and the portfolio art exhibition, which is our senior um, visual art showcase. Um, it's an exciting time to be um, surrounded by the arts at Flint Hill. Great. Yes, arts, arts jam and the month of April should definitely count as kind of a singular entity. It's really dynamic. Uh, Zach, how about you? Uh, hello, yeah. Um, so just to answer your question, Karen, yeah, I think this approach to learning does trickle through um, basically the curriculum at Flint Hill. So I think you will find variations, you know, theme dependent variations in all of the um, subjects, right? So what we do in science is a little different just in terms of how we would do um, or how we would allow students to pursue uh, their own interests. But I definitely think sharing out um, poster presentations like Ricky uh, called is one of the themes of, of a major scientific conference. We do them too. Um, and so, yeah, I think you're going to find that theme um, is highly used. An example of that, so a lot of science programs that you'll find will teach something, you know, will teach a bit of content and then they will do a lab that whose intention is to sort of confirm what the students have learned or, or to just reinforce that. Uh, within our science classrooms, I think you'll find uh, we want the students to not just confirm what I've already told them, uh, but to then take that in a direction uh, that they find interesting. Um, so further investigations into whatever it is we taught um, and, um, analyses, independent research projects, things like that. An example I gave at the, at the, um, uh, the seminar, the, the talk yesterday uh, was looking at gene trees. We do a, a, a unit uh, at the end of the advanced biology class called Life's Origins, where we're talking about the steps uh, that it takes to go from a, a planet without life to that first living thing and, and the methods they use to study uh, what that thing might have been. And that involves a lot of evolutionary history, a lot of putting together evolutionary relationships. And then I give them access and teach them how to use a professional database of um, genomes from bacteria, which is probably what that first organ organism was. And I tell them, here is a gene sequence. I want you to tell me everything about it. How did it evolve? Why is it present in all of these other bacteria? Are there any interesting uh, patterns you find in terms of where it might have been useful, did its use change in a different bacteria? And you get a lot of these things, right? You get a lot of, uh, some of them are matches for um, uh, diseases, you know, uh, bacterial infections, some of them are, are different, but it's, it's fun because they, I could give every one of those students the same gene sequence and they would all give me back a different story. And I like that aspect of it because it's them sort of going in whatever direction they want with this thing. I'm more interested in the geography. I'd like to learn gene duplications. And frankly, it's hard. And I'm always very, very impressed that every student by the end, if given enough time and enough guidance, will come up with a real professional looking story uh, that is defendable. And it's also fun because I will tell you that I don't know the history of every one of those genes. And so all I can do is look at their results and tell them whether or not they have done a good job convincing me from the data that it's true and I'm a professional arguer. So um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's fun to have them do that. So I think they get into it. I think it's a, there's a lot of um, sort of eyes wide open at the beginning and then a lot of fun when they start getting results. And I would just sort of jump in too to kind of pull together all of it. And um, Karen, with your question, our, we have a document called The Portrait of the Student. You can actually find it on our website under academics. And it talks about the pillars that really ground all of our academic programs. And it's we call it a portrait of a student instead of a portrait of a graduate. 
because we want every student at every grade level, if it's kindergarten, if it's eighth grade, if it's 11th grade bio, like Zach, uh, Dr. Crew just talked about, like, um, the, we want those pillars really embedded and each discipline does it a little differently. And so we, w one of them is self-directed learning. So that inquiry process and that construction of knowledge is something that you find interwoven in various ways and what I love is like in those curricula that are around 11th and 12th grade, some of the 10th grade starts to get into it too, where you start to weave together um, really deep scholarship. And as um, you know, one of my sort of favorite ones that I've seen recently is a project where uh, the teacher allowed students to go out and find math in the world. And so there was a pair of students who looked at movie posters and picked out the shapes and then came up with the mathematical formulas. This was a multivariable calculus. And then what I loved seeing was how they had used their digital art um, skills. We have a great uh, sequence of skills for students studying digital arts and their ability to bring together their math with their understanding of how to visually um, communicate information. And that's where I think you really get a lot of great, uh, where students, you know, they have to learn the basics before they can pull it all together. But in those um, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade classes where they start. So is it like fair to say yeah, then that there group. is, oh, sorry. Happy. Oh, am I? Am I the one that's slowing down? Yep. Uh, Emily, it does appear you're lagging a little bit, um, but I think, and this will probably happen throughout the course of this event. But Karen, did you have a question? Yeah, I mean, maybe just uh, then a confirmation. I mean, it seems that then i mean as the students i guess just you know evolve through their uh, middle school and high school experience they do have um or let's say they do ease into um like independent work and uh, research approaches and um you know just you know learn how to write a paper <laughs> <laughs> or, pro, you know, the paper is kind of what comes at the end, right? I don't want to focus so much on the paper, but much more on the idea, you know, how do I find an interesting question that's actually worth analyzing and looking into and then, you know, figuring out how to go about it. I guess that's where the exciting, exciting part is, right? I mean, the paper just comes in the end. And of course, there are things to follow. But um, yeah, so... I think that is starting early if I hear you and um, is that correct mm -hmm. to say that students actually do that throughout their high school, maybe already middle school experience. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. And starting with the, the building blocks, right? So it'll look a little more basic in ninth grade. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, everything else would also be very overwhelming, I guess. <laughs> it needs to be. <laughs> right build uh build up awesome yeah okay anyone else have a specific question we've got some a bank of questions that really get us into some great discussion too and help us tell some stories um you know so one that comes up a lot and this is a dr krug um get ready to explain physics first to us why do we teach physics in ninth grade and then go chemistry, bio, and all of our choices? You know, it's funny. I actually pulled up the slideshow that I made for one of these and at one point, but I won't go into it. Um, but please, because um, this will be the third time in three days. So if you've heard it, uh, feel free to just start asking questions right in the middle of it. And, um, you know, I'd be happy to answer any of those questions as well. But uh, it, it, this actually comes, Karen, from what you were just saying about the ability to, it, it's a very deliberate choice to see our curriculum not as a series of independent classes, but as a cumulative experience where the students are building towards this goal of being a scientist, right? And the idea that science isn't just a bunch of universal truths that I will get up there and, and, and present to the world, but really a, a method of problem solving that they need to uh, understand and get good at. 
So physics to chem to bio has just an enormous amount of de developmental and pedagogical uh, value for that. And I'll just go through a couple of those examples. Uh, the first is just if you're going to look at the scientific world and do what we want you to do, which is to explain it, to develop models that will explain the natural world that we could use uh, to make predictions, you're moving from simple to complex systems by going from physics to chem to bio. So you're progressively trying to analyze things that are more and more complicated. Physics, everything works perfectly. Uh, I could see it all. I can manipulate it. If I drop my phone on Earth, it will accelerate at 9.8 meters per second no matter what I do, right? And that's just, it always works, right? So I'm not going to mess that up. And so the students can then make these observations, relate their graph, relate their equation to a physical thing that they can see. When you move to chemistry the next year, you're going to be doing the same stuff, but now you can't see it. So all of the, all of the skills that they learned in modeling to try to create, you know, explanations for the world. Now they're going to have to do that with, with things they can't see, where electrons might be, the structure of the atom, what's going on with the, the relationship between, uh, uh, you know, pressure and temperature. They don't, they can't see pressure or temperature. They can only measure it and infer those relationships. So um, you go, the, the transition from physics to chem uh, is an important one. And the, it really has a big impact on biology because biology is basically applied physics and chem. Everything in the natural world requires those laws or overcomes it. Everything that's going on in your body right now, you need enzymes because the activation energy for certain uh, reactions isn't high enough. So you need something to drive it forward or you take advantage of the fusion. Things will tend to move this way. So I don't need to waste energy on that. All of those things come from physics and chem. And if you have that knowledge, you can do a lot more biology. And it turns that back into a data collecting hypothesis testing science as opposed to a, uh, um, you know, eight months of terminology and, and memorization. Um, so it, it's as the evolutionary biologist, I, I love that I can do all of that stuff through the stats, through modeling, do investigations in biology. Um, the sequence of topics works better. Physics ends with energy. You know, at the end of physics, it's more uh, kinetic potential, these types of things, but they do a deliberate uh, transition into the types of energy they'll study in chemistry, and chemistry has a lot to do with energy uh, all the way through it. Why do these reactions run? How uh, endothermic or exothermic, all those things. All of that stuff is a study of energy. Um, and then the end of chemistry, if you were to transition into a biology curriculum, the first things are macromolecules, nutrients, um, photosynthesis, respiration, this all involves a lot of chemistry. So the flow uh, of the content works a lot better that way. And like I always talk, this is not just me, but I'm always in Mr. Weeks's ear uh, about this, but just looking at the, the alignment with physics, chem, and bio in terms of what they need for math. Uh, believe it or not, physics can be taught entirely with algebra and graphs. I have been assured repeatedly that, you know, all of the math they would need uh, for the beginning semester, they have had, they, most of the students in ninth grade will have had algebra, but even if they haven't, the pre-algebra class will do the basic, uh, the, the basic math skills that they would need. And frankly, they have the graphical skills and we teach them how to do it all with graphs. So if you know how to make a graph, you could do that. Um, chemistry, geometry really helps with chemistry. So they have them there. And then you, if you really want to analyze what I like to call chaotic data sets, like you get in bio, because like I say, in physics and chem, everything works perfectly provided that you run the lab right. Uh, those are sort of the fundamental sciences, right? They, they, are, they will always work in the universe. Uh, for some reason, biology doesn't do that, right? I mean, they are much more chaotic systems. They interact with their environment. You know, I run this lab where I'm doing populations and I'm growing yeast and they all start the same and all of those curves end up differently because those things are living. Some of them are healthy. Some of the little temperature differences are, are weird. So you need stats and, and more advanced math skills to be able to do biology right. So in all those ways, putting physics first, just it, it really creates a three classes that are in a sequence where the students have this, you know, three year scientific experience building to exactly what Karen said, which is the ability to make arguments out of complex data sets and ask the right questions. Can I add just a really quick, as a parent, um, my daughter Penelope is a junior 
and she transferred in this year um, from a school that taught physics at the junior year. Um, so she was a little behind and had to go and take physics this year as a junior in a class full of freshmen. Uh, first of all, I will tell you if your child's a transfer student, that worked out perfectly. She's doing great in that class and she's doing great with the transition. Um, many times she has told me, I wish I knew this stuff before I took biology and chemistry, um, many times. Uh, and so according to my daughter, there are two kinds of schools, those that teach physics first and those that haven't figured it out yet. Um, so just know that the Vent House household is 100% is in support of this program. Yeah, I mean, often, I mean, we come from the international school environment and as you know, they kind of do integrate it, but it's also not really integrated. And then students just, I mean, if they kind of don't, I mean, you know, somehow if, I mean, many of them just choose not to do physics in the end, right? Because they think, I don't know. I mean, it's just a very small, often there are no students even choosing physics. They do maybe bio and they end up what you said. I mean, my son is doing it very unfortunate. It's just like a lot of memorization. It's very unsatisfying in a way. Yeah. I mean, um, well, they, they think so that physics sounds like is math. a good approach also to uh, maybe yeah. stimulate uh, students right with the STEM fields and where they otherwise just maybe, I don't know, you know, a lot of students may just fall off the bandwagon, I guess. <laughs> the well, a, lot, would... a lot of people will see physics as math, bio is memorization, and chemistry is just unapproachably hard, right? And um, exactly they're not, that. they're like, they're, 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 they're what professional physics, chemists, and bias do in terms of how they approach these things is, is actually very similar. And I will say, James, just to, you know, to follow on for you, 10 years ago, I was hired here. And the first thing Flint Hill did was to send me out to get trained in this certain method of teaching uh, physics to freshmen, right? And um, I knew a lot of physics. I was a, a geologist, but that involves a lot of physics. So I knew all the rules. And I will tell you, even I, going through that training just i i had not made the links between some of the equations mm -hmm. i knew and you know what they looked like on a graph and where these things came from and that the area under the curve was representing something I, even i hadn't really thought of it that way i just was really good at algebra and so i could solve all of the physics problems and so mm -hmm. e even that two weeks for me was sort of enlightening like i did not think of that right you know, if i were to go the line is one thing and the area under the curve makes sense and this is it and i it was a real sort of eye opener for me and i had done mm -hmm. truckloads of it so well, it's really the power of that constructivist model of curriculum which is really and in a minute i'm going to give the chairs a little time to think but because processing's good but so chairs think a little bit about what Dr. Uh, zach has talked to us about and then like what what are those ways we've intentionally in other curricula shifted a little bit from a traditional uh, sequencing or approach and the benefit that you're finding that. So I'm going to give you a minute to talk, but just to kind of tag into what Zach was talking about. Uh, you know, we, we find with this approach that many, many students after, right, the physics, chemistry, bio, Zach, right, we're running a lot of high level advanced placement um, sections. We run four sections of AP Physics, right? So it's it, it's really growing scientists who can then decide to go to AP Bio because they've had um, a really strong, uh, it, it, you know, the 11th grade advanced bio classes and they're like, oh yeah, I want more of that. Or they might go back to AP Chemistry because they love the invisible science sack maybe, right? And then um, certainly might go off into our AP physics as well as our, our curricula that support uh, the inquiry around scientific research. So, uh, and that's true in many of our, um, you know, at looking at the big picture of all of our curricula and these intentional ways that we build the sort of foundational skills so that students can really take off when their brain, when they're about in 11th grade, you know, sometimes it happens when you're in 10th grade, sometimes a little bit closer to 12th grade, your brain changes and you can do more complex and sophisticated academic work. And then that's where you really see our um, students being able to engage in really high level work. And chairs, I'm gonna get to in just a minute.
But one of the questions kind of feeds into this, like the differences between our honors and advanced placement classes and our on-level classes. And so just, you know, that idea that we really see students growing and then really taking off when their brain, it's like the right time for them. Um, so we have a number, I mean, you can take a look at our program guide and see, I think we're now running 26 different uh, advanced placement classes. And in many of our curricula have added post AP classes. So like in classics, we have a Latin uh, seminar that's taught at a college level. Um, we have, uh, I don't know, I'll let Mr. Uh, Ricky Weeks talk a little bit about the many, many um, sections of post AP BC calculus and uh, some of the great work that they're doing. Our sciences, our social sciences, and our history curricula in the advanced placement. Um, the honors level is, so advanced placement is pretty known because that's something that's out there. It's um, curricula tied to the college board. We do require all of our students to take the tests at the end. It's not a, a choice. It's a part of what the curricula requires. Um, we find that it's a fabulous way for students to stretch themselves. And, um, you know, the science behind that is just that the exposure to advanced placement can often be the real value in your academic journey. It's not all about the score at the end. Um, is sort of that. Our honors classes allow students to have some choice in 9th, 10th, 11th, and even 12th to be balancing their whole academic load, right? Like the idea of taking five advanced placement courses here is, is really not in support of a student's whole child and their, whole, their holistic journey through high school because our classes really bring quite a bit of rigor. So the honors gives students a little bit of stretch, but maybe also a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, and then our on-level classes, if anyone in the group has um, rising ninth grade, um, you know, that's where you really want to be thoughtful about the transition to high school, which is a huge social emotional transition and balancing workload with um, having some classes where maybe students can feel really strong and confident and really just balancing that whole picture. But I am gonna get back to the chairs as I promised. Anybody wanna go first with their sort of unique approach and how that benefits students? Um, I'll jump in. Uh, I think one of the ways that we are, um, like Zach said, and that transforming the curriculum in the arts is through the lens of equity and inclusion. I think that's where we continue to do more training, continue to do more research, and continue to discover better ways to um, to approach our curriculum. Uh, one of our lower school music teachers led us through, or led me through, um, a workshop on decolonizing the music classroom, um, and just looking at how traditional music education has been through a very narrow lens. Um, and that expands to the definition of classical music, the definition of the canon of music that we study, which, believe it or not, um, based on my research, has a lot to do with what RCA Records was doing in the 20s and 30s when they first decided to record music. Uh, RCA had a box of what they considered to be the canon of music. Um, and we've taught that music and we've, we've held that music up as the standards. Um, but it's time to stop letting record executives from the 1920s determine our curriculum. Right. It's time to look to other composers and other other points of view in the world of music. And the same thing with dramatic literature. Um, the canon of dramatic literature is very Western. Uh, we think of theater history as being something that started with the Greeks and then went on to Shakespeare and then went on to you know Arthur Miller and Eugene O'Neill in America. And again, there's a there's a much wider world of that. Um, you know, I've been doing this for 23 years and I look at some of the things that we thought were complete in our education. Um, 23 years ago, and it's, you know, it's almost embarrassing to look back um, and see what we were doing back then. And then maybe 20 years from now, we'll look at what we're doing today as being a step on the journey of getting better with equity and inclusion as, as it applies to our curriculum. Um, so there's a constant level of improvement uh, year after year 
where we are looking at what are we missing? Uh, you know, they're called blind spots for a reason, right? Because we don't know they're there. <laughs> um, and then we are continually looking for for how to expand the curriculum and, and widen it into ways that we, we hadn't thought of before. Thank you. I can chime in next. Um, so one of the ways that uh, math um, kind of is a little different here would be uh, similar to what uh, Dr. Krug saying about how they approach science. Um, in terms of really experiencing the math first before formally being introduced to any notation or, or any equations or things like that. But really, you know, through graphs or through problems, uh, gets, gets students thinking already kind of logically about uh, what might we do or what might we need to solve this problem and then construct the math with them, um, kind of bring them along that journey. And then at the end, give them the formal language to be able to represent it. Um, and that focus on on structure, I think, really supports, um, you know, the on-level classes, but also all the way up to our, our AP courses where structure is really, really important um, in, in some ways, the, the foundation of calculus, for example. But um, in terms of the, the levels of courses, you know, a lot of it is how much scaffolding is available to students along that process, uh, where an on-level course might provide um, a little more a sense of guardrails, for example, um, on a process, uh, the upper level classes might be more open ended or um, allow students to come at it from from different angles. Um, so, you know, it's a it's very much a scientific approach to mathematics um, and, and constructivist in a way where the teacher really acts as a guide um, and brings students along from introduction to formalization of those concepts. Um, so just a little kind of different approach in terms of here's the theorem, now let's practice it. That's, that's not really what we do. Great, thank you. And I'll, Amy, could you go and then I'll address some of the chat, uh, chat questions. Sure, I think um, skill-wise in the history department, we are an inquiry-based, um, we do a lot of inquiry. We wanna build curiosity amongst our students. Um, we want to, we teach them what good questions look like and how to pursue those answers. Um, again, instilling this sense of um, curiosity. As far as content, um, much like James, we have been uh, very deliberate and intentional about including diverse voices in our curriculum. Uh, there has been, you know, historically so long where, uh, the typical narrative have, has been kind of only one way. And so um, making sure that, that events, that situations are, um, that, that everybody involved, we are hearing those voices. Uh, so that is something that we have been really uh, intentional about. Great, thank you. So we have two questions around academic advising. And so this is an approach where it's a couple of factors that really kind of come together to support students in really building their ideal academic um, course load at each, you know, at each year when you can make those. And, you know, it also happens kind of in the middle of the year because we have so many semester courses and electives that once students complete their ninth grade year, there's, there's levels and like windows of opportunity for more choice. And at the semester, sometimes it happens mid-year. So, oh, and Dr. Schmidt, uh, Maya Schmidt has joined us. She's our English department chair. So we're talking a little bit about academic advising and then, um, then we'll keep going with some questions. But so this is, um, you know, I guess the first thing as an incoming student, I would encourage anyone to reach out to Debbie Ayers She's our upper school academic dean and the assistant director of the upper school. And she um, works often with students who will just come and help, you know, listen to what their interests are. Uh, you know, we have such a, a really big catalog of courses that it might be hard for students to really know all of those details. Um, you know, I find myself sometimes talking with families and students and kind of listening to what their interests are and say, oh, well, do you realize we have this class? That sounds like something you're really, that you might be really interested in. And you're right at that, that moment where this elective would probably work in your program of study. Many, all students have advisors 
So about this time of year, they're meeting with their advisors. They're talking about what you have, you know, what are the required classes that you'll need to take next year? Where are opportunities? So it's really that part of the relationship building of our school program where students are known and they have wonderful um, teacher guides to kind of help shepherd them along in the process. And uh, they're just getting to know them and helping them you know, balance their academic course load. We still have, you know, there are lots of graduation requirements and those are there for a reason to help students really create the full transcript for the next um, stage in their life. And there's, we've done a lot of intentional work around really thinking about requirements. And I think we've got, We've still got a little room where I think we could tweak it. The chairs, I know, are probably all smiling in their head because they know how hard when you run something with so much choice, it's a really hard, you know, tweaking it this way and that and up and down. It gets a little, um, it's hard to completely predict where choice with teenagers will go. So it gets interesting sometimes. Um, but that's something that we know that we have to do well is the academic advising to help support them with so much choice. And then there was a question, how does Flint Hill organize the learning at the school level to continue to incrementally innovate? And I just wanna check, Karen, is that, are you talking about how do we support like our faculty and our administration in that or what? Yeah, I, I mean, um, right, I mean, it seems there is a, there seems to be this conscious process of uh, continuous learning at the school, right? So, which I think is great. It's also modeling, of course, to the students, right? We kind of, well, we are in a continuous learning loop somehow. Yes. So, um, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, you know, from an organizational perspective, I'm, you know, that's my passion. Yes. <laughs> I'm just a, a bit like, you know, how do you organize it, right? I mean, uh, of course, there's maybe an on-demand element uh, that teachers say, I want to learn about this, or we should be looking into so that, but like how, you know, I'm just uh, curious how that works as a school. I mean, obviously it's uh, something that's valued and where there's place, but you also always need a process, I guess, to kind of keep it going and have the entry points for people to bring right. ideas in. So I'm just wondering, is it organic or is there a process or it's a just happening both. because you hire the right people who stay I'll curious? I'll share a little bit. Well, it's actually all of that, right? Because it's, yeah. it's a complicated recipe to pull all of it together, to have this really entrepreneurial approach to education. Um, you know, I'll speak a little bit to what I see from an admin level, and then I'd be interested for the chairs to jump in and reflect, you know, how you see it kind of working out. The, we do a lot of intentional work at the admin level and at the school uh, leadership level to plan learning opportunities around strategic goals, right? So we're, we're always like, we're right now in a strategic planning process and identifying the areas that we think are the next areas that we need to invest in. And we provide um, learning opportunities by bringing in outside speakers, by designing learning sort of challenges. Um, right now, one of the things that we've done for many years is have faculty design teams that use design thinking to solve human-centered process uh, sort of issues. And, um, you know, we empower our teachers to explore and find solutions and bring ideas and get feedback and iterate and test it out and keep working on it. So it's that tinkering um, kind of culture that we build with that, that to solve things um, the design teams we're running right now are actually around professional development and around wellness and around community and culture. As you know, coming out of the last two years, we've seen challenges in all of those, just because it's looked so different and how we, the lack of being able to really build community and be together. Um, but I'd love to hear what chairs kind of see is that how, how does the school support that learning? Anybody want to jump in? I can. 
Go ahead. I think Great you're nail on the head with good uh, hiring. Obviously, you hired great department chairs, so that's a huge start right that's there. Right. But, yeah, it's, uh, um, but I, I think the uh, support for professional development from a budgetary standpoint and from a leadership standpoint, that the encouragement um, for, for outside professional development is key to that process. I, I, I would. Yeah, go for it, Maya. No, I was just going to say we do a lot of things internally too. Like we have PD within our, you know, within our school that people who have a great idea will will we'll ask them to share it with the larger faculty. Uh, we go to conferences. Um, we've brought in uh, college professors occasionally to to talk to our department about like how English has changed in college versus what we're doing here. We talk to alumni. So those things all sort of. Um, inform what we need to do, what we want to do. Um, and it, it isn't, I mean, we love, we all love learning, so it's not really a conflict. <laughs> yeah. That sounds great. That's true. Yeah. How much you love learning definitely makes it an, an easier sell to keep learning. I'd say the PDBFFF, which is a professional development by faculty for faculty, I would say might be the biggest secret sauce contributor organizationally, where people can learn from colleagues and try it out. In fact, before you all joined the call, we were just talking about something Amy and I learned in a professional development uh, by faculty for faculty around, um, I don't know, Amy, like it, it's about a way to disseminate information in a really micro way and empowering people to do that. Anybody else want to jump in on PV? Yeah, and I want to reiterate what James said, right? I mean, the, the faculty here are, I mean, we really hire thinkers and we hire innovators, but not people who just innovate because it's like, man, I'm bored with this. I want to do something new, right? It's very process oriented, especially, uh, you know, I'm blessed to be part of a department where, you know, everybody is, is friendly, everybody is sharing ideas, everybody is open, and this organically creates these, um, uh, these broader ideas and that you can fix. And uh, I'll just give the example of advanced bio, uh, those classes that we have at the top. Uh, that was not me sort of um, dictating to the department that I think there's a problem and this is how we should do it. This came out of conversations with uh, that I had with with uh, one of the bio teachers who was complaining, not complaining, but discussing how this lab wasn't work or he didn't think, feel like the students were really engaged in this topic. And then I had another conversation with another one. He's like, oh, no, I, you know, I, I feel like, you know, they're learning a lot, but I don't feel like they really want to do this and that. And so we had this, you know, sort of uh, iterative approach where it's like, OK, we really want students to buy in and be able to pursue, you know, everybody seems to like one unit of bio. And then not so much, you know, some of these other ones. It's like, well, how do we let people hold on that and uh, really go as far with some of these units as possible? And there was conversations. And then we took an initial idea to, to Emily and, and reiterated that and we came up with this plan. So it's all very deliberate, but it all comes from great teachers, you know, really making an effort to... Um, uh, read the students, figure out what's working and what's not. And if what's not working is systematic, we, uh, we figure that out. Um, I'd add also that I think um, our, our use of technology um, really provides a growth edge as well. I think there's a, a focus on, you know, using it as a tool for learning, but also it connects us um, in, in ways that allow for faster sharing, quicker sharing of ideas, um, you know, staying connected to the outside world so that we're not so insular in what we're doing here, but connected to professional development circles and listservs and things outside that bring good ideas in that we can try on for size or figure out what that may look like at Flint Hill, um, you know, and, and just uh, having that as a tool and, and a central thing that's available to all faculty and students, I think really helps accelerate some of the innovation mm -hmm. that occurs here as well. Oh, good point. And really, you know, as I like listen to all of your answers, chairs, like it's it's also academic leaders who can, as everyone on this call is, who can hear those ideas and have those strong relationships. So as we talk about relationship building, understand it's very much a community value. It's not just teachers and students, but it's it's 
faculty and staff together. Also, you know, that even is a kind of a differentiator. At many independent schools, faculty and staff are two very different um, groups and kind of have different thoughts about each other. And here, it's very much faculty and staff together. We're all working, um, you know, for the common goal of creating great opportunities for students and in some ways for each other because we're a community of learners. And, um, you know, I always appreciate being able to hear ideas and learn from my colleagues. And um, so academic chairs, you guys should give yourself a round of applause really because it's, it's a lot of listening and knowing how to find the opportunity. There's a question in here I just want to get back to because it's a great one. So thanks for bringing it up. Will academic advising start after the placement testing process? I wonder if one of the admissions folks remind us when the placement process is that mid April. Uh, yes, Emily, we're actually going to get to that um, at the very uh, end in, oh, in regard okay. to important a little dates, teaser. But, uh, no, it's fine. The the first available date is. Uh, uh, Saturday, April 9, uh, and then I'll, I'll discuss the process uh, after that date. Right. So, in, thank you so much. So, um, you know, I think you can, um, you could certainly reach out and have questions, you know, ask questions about the academic advising prior to then. The having the data around the um, placement surveys and placement tests and being able to then look at the whole, you know, one thing I do uh, want to sort of tease out is we really look at it as a, uh, one piece of data in many pieces of data to understand where we think a student's next stretch level is. Um, so having more data will probably help us to be able to have a richer conversation about your student, but you could probably start, we could start conversations around academic advising to understand kind of what is required and where opportunities are at, at ninth grade. And placement testing is for uh, incoming ninth graders, yes, but really anyone who would be going into a leveled um, or a sequence. So in math and in our languages, uh, both modern languages and classics, and um, uh, certainly on, grade level courses like English and our histories. Did I miss anything? I don't think we have anything in innovation unless your student um, has a strong background in computer science and would want to know whether or not to go straight into an AP. We do have a, a diagnostic and some like interest in seeing portfolio of work to understand if they really have the computer science that we know leads to successful AP comp sci. Did I forget anything, Justin? I uh, know you're spot on. Oh, oh, I got an A on that one. Great. <laughs> <laughs> it would be if all right can, if I made a mistake though. If I can tie in just an answer to the question about uh, how we work with math anxious mm -hmm. students, I think part of it is this placement process and making sure that we can be as accurate as possible and putting them in that just right challenge. Um, and then having some flexibility in terms of having different levels of courses to respond to needs. Um, and I think, you know, throughout the school, especially in language and math, where we're, we have the ability to have leveled courses, um, we, we have done so very purposefully uh, to provide those spaces for students to be able to develop at their at the rate uh, that of, of the individual. Right. And then respond to that within our program. So you know, we have three levels of algebra, two, for example, um, because we know the ninth and tenth grade year is a year where students are still making some of those conceptual connections and, and getting the uh, ability to think abstractly you know, really kind of firmed up. So we have different kind of catching points for them to be able to respond to that. Um, but, you know, so placement is part of that process um, because anxiety comes sometimes from being put in a, in a situation that you're just not prepared for. So getting rid of that and then when they're in that space, um, providing them opportunities, one of the things that we try and celebrate here are mistakes, um, especially in the math department, because we know we're going to make them and, and those become opportunities for learning. Um, and as, as you kind of 
take away the pressure that is to always get right. Um, you know, and you had mentioned something earlier about the paper kind of being the end point and really the, the beauty of the learning is everything that led up to that. And the, the final answer in a math problem is very much like that, right? We want to see the thinking and all the stuff that's leading up to that. And the final answer is great. Um, but, you know, what about how we got there and, and the thinking that was required? And, and that's where I think we can really work with students to see that they are capable. Um, even if that final answer is elusive, we can we can find the steps where the breakdown is happening and, and fix it. And they mm -hmm. don't see themselves as just, you know, not capable. Um, they have some kind of entry point into that process. But it does begin with placement. Right. It's one of that right uh, stretch level. As you talked about that, it makes me like just sort of reflect on really our whole approach of math at Flint Hill and how many students now come to our 7th through 12th program from our lower school, really very well versed. And probably if they're talking with someone about math, they might even, the first question they might ask is, how did you get to that answer? Or like, oh, I got to it this way. How did you get to it? Like, because we really honor multiple ways to solve problems um, and that diversity of thought. So um, just kind of tease that out. I think it's really an, an interesting uh, like approach that might, the fact that it's become a habit of mind with so many students, it's really sort of culturally ingrained in our curricular. And it's, you definitely get it, I think in many uh, different disciplines, it just sort of is striking in math. Um, Ah, so anybody else? Did I miss any other chat questions? Thanks, Ricky, for talking about like productive struggle and those things. All right, so it's 9-11. Justin, is it time for me to turn it over to you? Uh, sure, sure, if there aren't any, any, um, any other additional questions. questions. Okay. So um, I'm happy, to, uh, department um, chairs, you're, you're welcome to stay on. You're also welcome to, uh, to jump off at this point. And I'm happy to stay on and answer any additional questions, um, you know, regarding the next steps in, in the admission process. And I think my colleague, Julie Lewis, is on uh, under the admission uh, account as well. Um, so, yep. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you again everyone. Okay. All right. I'll go ahead and jump off. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Thanks. All right. And Julie, you're welcome to unmute um, at any point uh, as well. But uh, so in, in terms of some of the events that are upcoming, uh, we did talk a little bit about uh, Saturday, April 9 being uh, the first placement uh, testing date for us. I do think it is worth pointing out that this will be the only Saturday uh, that we are able to offer uh, placement testing. So if for some reason um, your uh, child is not able to, uh, to join us on Saturday, April 9, you will uh, then uh, schedule additional times and dates directly with Maha Morse, uh, who is our registrar uh, here at, uh, at Flint Hill. Um, beyond that, we would certainly, you know, encourage you and remind you that uh, March 18th um, is, you know, our, our contract um, and enrollment date. Um, so please be mindful for that of that. Uh, excuse me. And of course, we're we're here uh, all next week to answer any additional questions that you might have, um, you know, re regarding um, you know the application process, school, really any questions that you have. Uh, beyond that. Um, on April 14th, we have our uh, upper school celebration date. Uh, so please uh, go ahead and, uh, and sign up for that. And then on uh, May 4th, we have our uh, new parent information night that we're excited about as well. Uh, Julie, did I miss anything? I think you do have it, but you know, just to reiterate that um, Justin, Lauren and I will be here if you have any questions um, regarding um, the enrollment process. Um, we will be here also next week. It, and today is our last day before um, the students and the faculty will have two weeks of spring break, but we will physically be here if in fact you wanna come take another look at the school. 
we'll be happy to, to you know, show you the building um, and meet with you to answer any questions you might have as you are making this very important decision. And of course, selfishly, we hope that you select Flint Hill. You've heard from our wonderful um, chairs um, about our academic program and everything that they are doing to continue to uh, challenge our students and also to challenge us to continue to think and learn. Um, we're a school of lifelong learners, and I hope that that really uh, came across during this meeting today. Thank you again uh, to everybody for uh, taking the time to, uh, to join us this morning. And, uh, you know, again, we'll be around uh, next week um, if anybody needs any uh, additional help. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a wonderful weekend. Have a wonderful right. weekend.